One night, you're working a suspiciously quiet shift at your hospital's A&E department, when all of a sudden you're swept into action as Daniel, a 28-year-old man, is rushed into the department in a flurry of paramedics. Daniel was stabbed outside a pub and is now crying out in pain, clutching the right side of his chest and struggling to catch his breath. You rush to examine Daniel and find his coma score to be 13, him to have a fast heart rate, rapid, shallow breathing and a low blood pressure. The pain he's experiencing is worse when he's trying to take a breath in. You look closer and find his chest to be hyper-expanded, with reduced breath sounds and hyper-resonance on the right side. His trachea is deviated towards the left, and the veins in his neck are swollen and distended. As Daniel continues to deteriorate, you realise what must be done, and rush to grab a 16-gauge cannula, which you carefully insert into his right second intercostal space, midclavicular line. The needle has its desired effect, and a rush of air can be felt coming out of its open end. Fortunately, Daniel begins to stabilise, and with the help of the emergency team, you are able to develop a longer-term management plan. Daniel was presenting with the life-threatening complications of a tension pneumothorax, a complex, often traumatic complication of excess air building up in the pleural cavity. To understand what happened to Daniel, we need to take a closer look at the layers of the chest wall. My name's Connor, and welcome to 5 Minute Anatomy. Posteriorly, the thorax is bounded by 12 thoracic vertebrae. From each of these projects two paired ribs, which curve downwards as they travel anteriorly. The ribs thus form most of the lateral and anterior wall of the thorax. On the most anterior part of the thorax sits the sternum, which can be divided into three parts, the manubrium, body and xiphoid process. The ribs connect to the sternum via the costal cartilage, which is partially deformable connective tissue that allows the chest wall to move a little. The first seven ribs connect directly to the sternum via their costal cartilage and are thus known as true ribs. The eighth, ninth and tenth ribs connect indirectly by connecting to the costal cartilage from the layer above and are thus known as false ribs. And finally, the eleventh and twelfth ribs do not connect to the sternum at all, earning them the name floating ribs. Between each of the ribs are regions known as the intercostal spaces. The intercostal spaces contain three layers of intercostal muscles, the intercostal nerves and the intercostal arteries and veins. The muscles of the intercostal space are helpfully named the external intercostal muscles, internal intercostal muscles and innermost intercostal muscles in order of depth. The deepest layer is the innermost intercostal muscles, whose fibres travel obliquely from anterior to posterior. These are the least distinctive muscular layer and are best demonstrated in the lateral chest wall. The internal intercostal muscles are similar to the innermost intercostals and travel in the same direction. They go from the sides of the sternum to the angles of the ribs, ending as a thin aponeurosis known as the internal intercostal membrane. Lastly, we have the external intercostal muscles, which pass obliquely between the ribs from posterior to anterior, in the opposite direction to the innermost and internal intercostal muscles. They run between most of the posterior and lateral parts of the thorax before ending at the costal cartilages. At this point, they produce another thin aponeurosis known as the external intercostal membrane. Now, important to note with these muscles is that they're involved in assisting respiration but also have the secondary function of protecting the precious neurovascular bundles that supply the chest wall. These neurovascular bundles exist as a main bundle in the groove of the upper rib and a collateral bundle just superior to the lower rib. They sit nestled between the internal and innermost intercostal muscle layers. These neurovascular bundles are composed of an artery, nerve and a vein. In the posterior, the intercostal artery comes straight off the aorta whilst in the anterior it comes from the internal thoracic or mammary artery. The veins similarly either drain into the azygous system in the posterior or the internal thoracic vein in the anterior. Lastly, the intercostal nerves emerge in the posterior as the anterior rami of their respective thoracic nerves. They split to travel in the main or collateral neurovascular bundles. These nerves also produce some cutaneous branches that supply the skin overlying the thorax. The last two layers we should be aware of before we reach the lungs are the pleura. These are two layers of thin, moist connective tissue that runs over the inside of the chest wall and over the surface of the lungs. 
The layer running directly in contact with the lungs is known as the visceral pleura, whilst the layer in contact with the chest wall is the parietal pleura. We'll do a more detailed video on the anatomy of these pleura as well as the lungs in a later video. For now, you should know that there's a potential space between the visceral and parietal pleura known as the pleural cavity. In healthy people, this contains 10 to 20 milliliters of pleural fluid, which acts to adhere the two layers together and lubricate them during movements of the lungs. Anything other than this small amount of fluid in the pleural cavity is pathological and is caused by an underlying issue. Okay, let's use our new knowledge to work out what happened to Daniel and how his initial treatment worked. Daniel had been stabbed in his anterior lateral chest wall and the knife had pierced his lungs on the inside. This means the knife would have first travelled through his skin and subcutaneous fat, then through the external intercostal muscle, internal intercostal muscle and the innermost intercostal muscle. It would also have pierced the parietal and visceral pleura, then the parenchyma of the lung. The damage to the lining of the lung means that, as Daniel breathes in, a small amount of air can escape the lungs and enter the pleural cavity, which would normally only contain pleural fluid. Air could also be entering the pleural cavity through the hole in the chest wall. The true problems arise when the air cannot escape this pleural cavity once it has entered. In Daniel's case, this was occurring as the skin, fat and intercostal muscles had closed somewhat over the wound site. As the air begins to build up in the pleural cavity, it begins to increase its volume on the affected side. This increases and increases before it compresses the lung on that side and causes it to collapse. Every breath Daniel takes in causes the air in his pleural cavity to grow in volume, worsening the problem. Eventually, the air volume can become so great that it pushes the lungs, heart and other organs to the side in a process known as mediastinal shift. This can be disastrous, as it compresses the arteries and veins leaving the heart and eventually leads to cardiovascular collapse. Fortunately, you noticed what was going on and acted fast. By inserting a wide-bore needle into his second intercostal space in the midclavicular line, you were able to allow the air to leave the pleural space, thus reducing the compressive effect on Daniel's thoracic organs and saving him from cardiovascular collapse. This method of emergency needle decompression isn't always successful, but it's often attempted as a rapid response to a tension pneumothorax and may end up saving a patient's life. Okay, there we go. That's a bit of the anatomy of the chest wall and one potential mechanism behind a tension pneumothorax. Go and have a read up on the topic and check out some of our other videos which cover the surface anatomy of the thorax amongst other things. In the meantime, subscribe to our channel so you don't miss future uploads and have a great day.